relies on oxygen. From cognition to digestion, effective breathing not only provides us with greater sense of mental clarity, but also helps us sleep better, digest food more efficiently, improve our body's immune response, and reduce stress levels. We are learning about respiration as a part of biology in class 10. Today's session on respiration and respiratory disorders is an extension of classroom, classroom learning. Today, we have with us Dr. Mahesh P.A., a well-known pulmonologist in Mysore. We are indeed honored to have you, sir. We welcome you to our school. I also thank you for accepting our request and gracing this occasion, taking time from your busy schedule. Now, I request Ms. Lakshmi K. Vinod to formally welcome the gathering and introduce our guest speaker of the day. Lakshmi? Yes. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to our interactive session today. In today's times, all of us are increasingly aware of the importance of maintaining our health and immunity. We realize the importance of fitness and various, various exercises which help to strengthen ourselves and particularly lung health. In this context, I welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Mahesh PA, MBBS, DTCD, DNB, to the session, who will help us to give more insights on the same. He is a pulmonologist specialized in the respiratory system and its diseases. Speaking about Dr. Mahesh PA, he is currently working as a professor in JSS Medical College, JSS AHER, Mysore. He completed his MBBS degree from Kasturba Medical College, University of Mangalore. Diploma in tuberculosis and chest diseases from Medical College, Trivandrum, University of Kerala. He adorned many administrative and scientific positions and received many fellowship awards during his illustrious career. To name a few, Fellow of American College of Chest Physicians, FCCP, Fellow of Indian College of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology in the year 2014, Young Scientist Sundarama Award, 35th National Conference of the Indian College of Allergy, Asthma and Applied Immunology, Trivandrum 2001. He also has many international and national publications under his credit. These are just a few of his achievements. We welcome you, sir, to the session. Yeah, thank you. Shantala and thank you, Lakshmi, for your kind introduction. And I'm I... quite happy today. Yeah, thank you. So, shall I start? Shall I start? Uh, yeah. She she has some more uh, words to say, yeah, sir. Oh, oh, all right, all right, please. I uh, welcome our principal, Mr. Matthew KG, to the session, who always inspires us to go beyond the traditional ways of acquiring knowledge and believing practicing the same. I welcome our supporting Vice Principal, Ms. Gobain Matthew, and all our congenial colleagues. Also, I welcome our students who are the main stakeholders of this program and wish that let them be immensely benefited by this session. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Dr. Mahesh. Uh, yeah, yeah, good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for. Uh, accepting uh, our request and in spite of your busy schedule for being with us this morning. Sure. Joined a little late, <laughs> so I couldn't. Yeah. So uh, I think, Shadala, I think uh, Dr. Mahesh can start the session. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you, Lakshmi, yeah. and sir, over to you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for this opportunity to share my thoughts with the young minds. They are the future. And uh, I hope some of them at least will take up medicine and uh, go on to help the community. So today we are talking about one of the most important organs in the body. Without oxygen, no one can survive for more than three minutes. So it's critical that we maintain the health of the respiratory system. So I have uh, divided uh, the scope of the discussion today into just a few bits. There are more than 3,000 respiratory diseases. Uh, though the general medicine, uh, you know, MDs uh, study the whole body for uh, three years, we study only the lungs for three years. 
so you can imagine the depth of uh, of the knowledge that is available uh, related to the respiratory system at present. I will just mention only a few highlighting some important points. We look at the structure and function. We look at few common respiratory diseases. Because of the advent of COVID-19, I would like to talk about how do we go on to protect ourselves. And I leave about 15 minutes for the question and answers, which you can maybe put in a chat box or you can ask directly whatever is suitable. Now the basics of the structure and function. If you look at the respiratory system, it starts from the upper respiratory tract. And if you look at the nose, you have a lot of convoluted mucosal surfaces. What does this do? The air that we breathe is not going to go in a straight line, what we call as a laminar flow. It's going to use a turbulent flow. So what does it do? All the particulate matter, infections that are there, noxious matter, every part of the air touches the mucosa, which is lined by a gel-like liquid. And it just absorbs all the noxious material. So the air that goes in is warmed to the body temperature. You can go to Mount Everest. The air that you breathe will still reach when it, re when it reaches the lungs, which is very sensitive to temperature, is still at body temperature. And all the noxious particles are removed. That's the beauty of the upper respiratory tract. Now we have the epiglottis. Generally, that close off when we swallow to make sure that the food doesn't enter the respiratory tract. Now, this closes off the air passage when we swallow. Of course, you all know about the larynx, that is the voice box. The trachea is a single tube that's now going to take all this air that you breathe into the both the lungs. And you will find that the movement of the lungs, lungs is like an elastic rubber band. It stretches, when it stretches, it sucks in the air. And the main muscle for that is the diaphragm. So diaphragm is a kind of muscle, what we call as a skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is under your control, voluntary control. You can move any muscle of your body that you like. Now there are other group of muscles called like smooth muscles or headache muscles that are not under voluntary control. You can't control your heart rate as you wish. You can't control the movement of the smooth muscles of the stomach or the intestines as you wish. They move on their own at, under a different control, not under conscious control. But diaphragm is a skeletal muscle and all skeletal muscles get fatigued. If you walk, you may train yourself, but after a time, even a marathon runner will get fatigued. But we breathe from birth Till we die. But diaphragm is a special skeletal muscle in that it does not get fatigued. So that's the most important part of a diaphragm. Class, class is a class. Now the lungs has it moves into the right and the left lung, and you have three divisions. On the right, that's the upper lobe, that's the middle lobe, and the lower lobe. And then you have two divisions on the left. No gas exchange takes place here, but you have filtration of the, all the noxious material infections in a large number of branches. If you look at the surface area of the lung, it covers a tennis court. It's such a large surface area. And how such a large surface area is just maintained just within the chest cavity? Ah, so that is something that we are still wondering, even after spending 25 years in respiratory medicine. It's such an amazing organ. And that surface area helps us in the gas exchange. Now, it is held in place from collapsing by what we call as a cartilage. So they, they keep these airways open. Otherwise, they can collapse. And as you move towards the periphery, the so-called respiratory bronchial, which will then move on into the alveoli and the alveolar sacs, we do not have the cartilage in this particular small area. And they are more amenable for destruction 
with some of the infections. And this respiratory bronchiole, which contains the alveoli onwards, is called as the functioning unit of the lung. Now, if you look at the branching system of the primates and humans, compared to that of other animals, now our branching system is far more sophisticated. The branches will lead to branches and lead to further branches, unlike these. This is called as the monopodial branching and we have bipodial and tripodial branching. And that's one of the reasons why we have the kind of surface area that we do. But this is the cross section of what we have uh, uh, in, the, in the lungs. Here you have this mucus, you have a lot of the cilia. Now this is how an electron microscopy of the cilia looks like. And uh, this is one ciliated cell. This is what we call as a goblet cell that produces the secretion that comes out and forms the mucus in which the cilia beats. And then, of course, you have the basal cells which can then again metamorphose to any of these cells. Now, why do we need this uh, cilia? As I said, we have these thin secretions in which all the noxious particle gets attached. But just like you clean your house, if you don't clean your house, there won't be a lot of dirt and dust. So you need to clean it off. So how do we clean our lungs? It is all the noxious particles are stuck in the mucosa. It is cleaned by cilia. It is moving continuously. You know how many times each cilia beats per minute? It is 1000 times. It beats at 1000 times per minute. That's how it beats it 1000 times per minute and each cell has 100 to 200 C. So one centimeter per minute is the moment of the mucus and lungs is cleaned continuously 24 hours a day from birth to death. That's why lungs remain so healthy unless there is an infection, be smoke, lot of pollution, very dusty occupation, then of course it gets infected. So this is how each cilia looks like. It's the ultrastructure of the cilia. This is the actual cilia. It's just a cartoon to look at how complicated this is. There are nine tubules here, nine pairs of tubules with the central tubule and they're all attached like a cycle spoke. And continuously there is a moment. If you know how the boat and use an oar, how to move the boat, you lift it, you go back into the water, you push it, you lift it. Exactly the same mechanism that happens here. Now the alveoli, if you, I'm sure you all see the mosquito net. So that is how our alveoli is. You have the thin wall in which you have the blood flowing, and then you have the holes in which the air is present, and then there is a continuous gas exchange. So this is the end point. The alveoli are the end point of the respiratory system where we have the gas exchange uh, that is taking place. You have the blood vessels, you have the lymphatics, you have the artery, the vein, all these, and then you have a very thin layer of cells, single layer uh, on the alveoli and single layer on the blood vessel, very thin interstitium that separates the space. So it's uh, very easy for the gas exchange to take place. One lung has 300 million alveoli. One lung has 300 million alveoli. And this is the one that gives us the surface area of a tennis court. The walls of the alveoli, single cell thick. So you have the deoxygenated blood coming in from the rest of the body. As it comes in contact with the alveoli, it gets oxygenated. And then it moves on back to the heart to be pumped to the rest of the body again. And the cycle goes on and on. Every minute, about five liters of blood is oxygenated in the lungs at rest. If you exercise, then it's going to be much more than that. If you look at the alveoli, there is a very thin coat of a gel-like material, what we call a surfactant, and the surfactant prevents the alveoli from collapsing. If you look at a balloon, you try to blow, in the beginning it's a little tough, it takes a little bit of air and then it, it's easier to blow, and then it reaches a level and then it again becomes difficult to put more air into it. So if, you, if the surfactant were not there, the alveoli would collapse and each breath would be very laborious. 
This is a jet light, just like your grease. It prevents the alveoli from collapsing. And therefore, the air is always there here. The air is never empty. It's, there, there's no point where you have zero air. It's always some air there. And therefore, it is easy to expand during every breath. Otherwise, breath would be very labor. Now, if you look at, you also have these kind of macrophages here. This is a typical alveolar uh, space. And then you have uh, special types of cells. You have type 1 cells, which are very thin. And you have type 2 cells, which can, if there is lung injury, help in the healing process. Oxygen diffuses, carbon dioxide moves out. And that's the basic function of the respiratory system. Lung is extremely active. There is a lot of other functions. With lack of time, I'm not going into details of any of those functions. Now, how do we protect our own lungs? What are the mechanisms that are present? First is the physical. Anything tries to enter the lung, we have cough. We just cough it out and throw it out. Whether it's sometimes food particles or there's any noxious material, we just cough and throw it out. Then I told you about mucociliary clearance. Everything else that enters, finer particles, gaseous material, all of them due to the turbulent flow will touch uh, multiple areas of the of the lung and the nose and this mucocellular clearance, it's all cleaned up. And then you have various cells. You have neutrophils, that, that's the first line of defense. You have the macrophages, you have the lymphocytes. So all the cells help in maintaining the defense of the lungs. Then you have what we call as cytokines. Now these are like a messenger. So these bring in any of the defense system. They help cells develop antibodies, they help the bring in all the cells. They are like the messenger cells. There is a problem. Please come here. What type of cell? What is going to be the defense response? They are going to look into that. Now we'll quickly go into some of the common respiratory diseases. I will start from the airways and move to the lung parenchyma as such, interstitium and the gas exchanging area and the plural substance. So I'm just quickly going to go through those. So let's first look into asthma. It's a very, very common respiratory disease. And this is how the normal air, air passage is. It's very easy for the air to go in and come out. And during an asthma, this gets inflamed and gets narrow. And there is a more severe form of asthma called as an asthma during an acute asthma attack, when it becomes very narrow. And this is when people find it very difficult to breathe or even talk. So how do these people present? They can have difficulty breathing, early stages they can have just dry cough. It becomes very difficult for the air to pass through. So the muscles will have to work very hard. And when the muscles work, they have chest pain. Lung as such doesn't carry pain fibers. You can cut the brain, you can cut the lung, there is no pain. But the muscles, because of the overwork, if you were to tie two kgs to your legs and start walking, your legs will start hurting. So you want to breathe in through a narrow air passage, then the muscles will start hurting. That's why there is chest pain. Cough can be more in the night due to exposure to the house dust mite. It's a very common allergen present in the bed and blankets. When it's become very difficult, then they cannot even speak sentences. They become so out of breath. Of course, there is wheezing. We have more than 3,000 respiratory diseases. These are the common respiratory symptoms that people have. Why do people develop asthma? It's basically, it's a genetic disease. You are born with an allergy switch, which can be switched on at any age, maybe in the first year of life, maybe at the age of 80 years. So what are the, some of the triggers? You have the house dust mines, you have the infections, you have the indoor and outdoor air pollution, you can have the pets, certain foods, and uh, food processing, uh, agents and colorants and preservatives, all these can trigger an asthma attack. So how do we, what do we do? Physical exercise is very, very important. That helps to maintain your immune balance. It's critical. A lot of people say, I stopped exercising, within one year I developed asthma. It's very, very common. So it's important that all young people maintain your physical activity as you are Go to the higher education, you have a lot more to study, but please don't forget to maintain your physical activity. 
what we use is an inhaled medication. The same medicines may be available in the form of oral, but they are 200 to 400 times higher dose. The ideal way is to use the smallest dose possible. Therefore, we have the least side effects and inhalers are the best way to treat. We go into the next common disease called a COPD. Again, this is one more AV disease. We can have what we call as a bronchitis. But the difference between asthma and this asthma is triggered by an allergen. Whereas the bronchitis here, also which causes airway narrow, uh, narrow airway passages, is triggered off by cigarette smoking. That's the most common trigger. The longer a person smokes, the higher the risk of this disease. What is the difference between this narrowing and the asthma narrowing? Asthma narrowing, we have good medicines to treat. Whatever we do, this is a permanent damage that will take many, many years of decades of smoking. And this cannot be reversed. Once this disease comes, it's a lifelong disease. Therefore, we tell everyone, almost 50% of smokers will develop this in their lifetime. Therefore, we tell everyone, don't smoke. The other important trigger is, of course, women who cook with wood fires or charcoal. They are also at higher risk of this disease. Of course, they don't have a choice. Now, with the PM Sujola scheme, we have been following about 4,000 women for 15 years in our studies. A lot of them are now moving to LPG. That's created a, a good change in their respiratory health. They have phlegm that simply doesn't go away. It's always there. This is the healthy lung. As we said about the mosquito net, you can remember all of them are completely destroyed. So you have a lot of air, but there's no blood. And this air is a waste, what we call as dead space air. It doesn't take part in gas exchange. It's pretty useless. It's simply sitting there. And uh, this makes it very difficult for a person to breathe. Therefore, don't smoke. Now, the symptoms are the same as asthma. They have cough, they have difficulty to breathe, they have a lot of phlegm. And the, completely the lungs will become uh, full of holes in these uh, patients. The other common disease, of course, is lung cancer. Now, lung cancer is a very dangerous disease. Uh, we don't have any good treatment for lung cancer, except for few lung cancers now, there are some good treatment. The most common reason is, of course, tobacco smoking. Second hand smoking is also important. The Japanese uh, study showed that women uh, whose husbands are heavy smokers also had increased risk of lung cancer. Many of them may have a family history of cancers. The main problem is tobacco smoke causes DNA damage. In the normal person, the cell DNA has mechanisms to repair itself. There is no problem. In some people, the DNA repair mechanism is not good. It fails. And then it can become cancerous. As soon as the cell becomes cancerous, we have our immune surveillance. As soon as the cell becomes cancerous, it becomes different. And it comes to the notice of our immune surveillance cells. Naturally, they are known as natural killer cells. They immediately kill the cancer cells. And people don't develop cancer. So failure of DNA repair mechanism failure of our immune surveillance leads to cancer. This is true of any cancer, though the risk factors may be different. They have now realized that air pollution, radiation, asbestos are all risk factors uh, in the for the development of lung cancer. What is hidden? Suddenly we started seeing a bunch of 25 year old young women non smoking develop lung cancer. For a long time I was wondering why are they developing cancers? And then my colleague came back from UK uh, and he's doing a lot of uh, work on pollution. He said, if you run a mosquito coil, he did all the studies. If you run a mosquito coil for six hours in the night, the so-called liquidators, it's equivalent to burning 100 cigarettes. Imagine using it for 10 years. If you burn an incense stick, five to 15 cigarettes, use all the diyas or lamps, oil or ghee lamps that you want, they are okay. If you burn an incense stick equivalent to burning 5 to 15 cigarettes, depending on the size and depending upon whether it's made in India or China, the Chinese incense sticks are more toxic. 
and then people burn the dhup sticks dhup sticks are equal to or the samrani sticks they are equal to 1000 cigarettes so these are the hidden mosquito coils incense sticks dhup sticks that are commonly used in the urban homes please be careful don't use them you can pray in a different way and those are to be avoided completely along with cigarette smoking now the symptoms of course it start with the cough people are generally about the age of 50 you can have blood there's a lot of they can have dc they are very fatigued they complain of chest pain when the cancer invades uh, the chest wall they can have weight loss so these are all the tests that we do we look at 50 plus smoker the risk factors we get an x-ray done doubtful it can do a ct scan or a Uh, put in a tube in there take a bit of material uh, from the tumor look at uh, check under the microscope confirm it is cancer if it is early stage we do a surgery if it is late stage they go on drugs or they go on radiotherapy not very very effective not very satisfactory but that's the best we can do in this current time now we move from the airway diseases into the parenchymal diseases now the most common one it's causing a lot of death in children and adults uh, is a pneumonia now pneumonia can be caused by bacteria including tuberculosis can be caused by viruses we all i'm am sure heard of covid 19 pneumonia it can be caused by fungi even parasites we use a chest x ray to suspect a ct scan can be done in some selected cases a blood counts can also be done sputum examination can be done uh, and checked under the microscope to see or even culture and then you see what kind it is and these are the symptoms of pneumonia they have fever they have chest pain they can lose uh, blood or become hypotensive and then have pallor of the skin low blood pressure they can cough out with or without sputum depending on the stage of pneumonia they can have body aches headaches uh, especially in the elderly they don't feel like eat person who was eating regularly doesn't want to eat anymore they may not even be coughing or having fever in the elderly the grandparents usually it's a sign of pneumonia smoking increases the risk physical activity is good improves the immune system uh, functions healthy diet is important junk food that people eat lack of fiber for a long time people thought fiber we cannot digest the fiber we don't have any enzymes we are not cows or goats we don't have the enzymes to digest the fiber why should we eat fiber then people realized that 90% of the cells in the human body are not human cells they are bacterial cells the so called microbiome in the human body every part of the body the git has the maximum the oral cavity the lungs the skin every part have bacteria and these are all beneficial bacteria they can digest the fiber they have the enzymes to digest the fiber and releases something called as short chain fatty acids that are not present in anything else you have to eat fiber to get the short chain fatty acids and that prevents a huge number of diseases wide spectrum of diseases and therefore lot of importance is now going into the diet and the fiber in the diet every day every meal to make sure that there is fiber the other thing that helps is the fermented foods when you ferment it now people use a lot of disinfectant in the house should never be used please just use soap water lot of disinfectants harm the good bacteria and when you remove the good bacteria from your system you have the resistant disease causing bacteria gaining access so healthy diet fiber rich fermented foods very very healthy of course frequent hand washing is useful vaccinations are useful to prevent and of course we treat it with the relevant antibiotic quickly about tuberculosis very very old disease even mummies they have found on on autopsy they have found that they have died of tuberculosis very very old disease they have taken the tb 
focus from a mummy, put it in TV culture medium, and the tubercle bacilli has grown after 5,000 years. The bacteria is not dead. That is why it's an extremely difficult disease to control. You please tell everyone that you see, don't spit on the roads. With people with TB bacteria, go on spitting on the roads. If everyone in India stops spitting from today onwards for the next five years, I'm sure we can now at least reduce 50% of the TB in the country. That is how it is spreading. Once it is there in the air, it simply spreads. It doesn't die and it can cause disease after many years after it is out. Sunlight, good sunlight, of course, kills the tubercle bacilli. These are all the signs, you have chest pain, loss of appetite, you can cough out blood, there is fever and chills, night sweats. Anybody coughing more than two weeks should get tested for TB. Please note, it's very, very important. In weight loss is there, more than 10% of the body weight, if somebody loses, they're not trying to lose weight, you have to rule out tuberculosis. Fever is critical, and then there is fatigue as well. How do we prevent? We have look at a uh, good diet again, avoid all the risk factors, again wash your hands frequently, house cleaning, good ventilation, good sunlight in the house is always useful. When people are coughing, uh, losing weight, please stay away, ask them to use a kerchief or a tissue when they are coughing. And if there is someone with TB in the house, at least until the start treatment for about three weeks, uh, they should use a different personal utensils. Now there is something called as interstitial lung disease. We looked at the gas exchanging unit of the lung. Now this has one layer of alveolar epithelial cells, thin basement membrane, very little, almost negligible interstitium, another very thin basement membrane, one layer of endothelium, that is the cells that line the blood vessel, or the so-called capillary, that is all is interstitial. And you have several hundred diseases that can affect this interstitial. The most difficult of them is what we call as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Generally, you see more in men, and the cause is unknown. We don't know what are the risk factors yet. 50% people die within two to three years. So it is like cancer. We don't have good drugs. Once you make a diagnosis, it's very, very difficult to treat. Completely, the lungs will shrink. It becomes what we call as honeycombing. I'm sure all of you have seen a honeycomb. You have seen how the normal lung looks like. Everything just becomes like a honeycomb. And it's very, very difficult to diagnose. Most physicians, including MD physicians, generally miss out on diagnosing this. And therefore, even the treatment is very delayed. Now we come, of course, to the pleural diseases. And uh, pleura, there are two. There is uh, one is called as visceral pleura and the parietal pleura. It's just like how you wear a bunion and a shirt. The visceral pleura is very close, very thin, and uh, touching the lung. And the parietal pleura is a little thicker and a little away from the uh, lung. There is the, like a grease, there is about 30 ml of fluid. It makes it very difficult, very easy for the lung to expand. If there is no grease, it will be very difficult. Again, every breath would be a labored breath. Because there is a grease, a very, very easy movement, and about 30 ml of this grease fluid is produced every day and just maintains the movement of the pleura so that the lung expands very, very easily. So, some of the common, so this is your chest wall, and this is the lung, and this is the pleural, this is the visceral, that's very close, this is the parietal pleura in contact with the chest. Fluid, that is between the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura, we call that as a pleural effusion. This uh, can be of different nature, uh, but any fluid here is called as a pleural effusion. Instead of fluid, it can be a bad infection, then you can get a pus, then it's called as an empire. Instead of these, in the same place, you can have air, and then this is called as a pneumothorax, air in the pleural cavity. So these are some of the common diseases that affect the 
plural. Now we will go into the next uh, maybe 10 15 minutes on about this COVID 19 and what should we do to protect ourselves. So we have been seeing COVID 19 patients uh, since about last March. We have even auscultated them, we have had close contact with them. Now, when I went for the vaccination, I just checked whether I was exposed. I checked my antibodies. I was negative. Which means, even after looking after COVID-19 patients closely, I was not infected. So how do we do that? Now I wonder why people are getting infected. If they don't see COVID patients. Okay, they don't handle COVID patients like we do. Now, we are not infected, but people are getting infected and causing this pandemic. So how do we go about doing that? What are the two main things that I did? So let's quickly go through that. So this, this virus has a special appearance and this looks like a crown, okay, right? And that is why it is called as the coronavirus. Corona means crown. So what is COVID-19? How does one get? How can I prevent some symptoms? And how is it diagnosed and protect? I'll go through that very quickly. Now SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 is a new virus. But coronavirus itself is not very new. It was first detected in China in late December 2019. People are always still wondering how. Possibly started in animals. They say from the wet market, the Chinese eat everything and there are different animals that are present. Normally, the virus that infects animals does not infect humans. But if a human is there in close contact, the coronavirus from the humans, generally it was not deadly earlier, mixes with the coronavirus from the animals and this now new virus can start infecting. We still don't know a lot about it. Now, it's been known for long. The first coronaviruses were found in animals in 1920s. From 1960s onwards, they realized coronavirus affected humans, but never serious. Nobody even treated that. From about 2003 onwards, the first deadly coronavirus again started from China called as the SARS virus, it didn't come to India. Then you have the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, also didn't come to India. Now this went everywhere with the COVID-19. That's when the lethal form came. The WHO made a lot of mistakes, gave a lot of wrong information and is responsible, I believe is responsible for the current pandemic. There is widespread human to human transmission a large number of affected countries. I don't think whether any country is spared. Maybe some islands which has very small population. Otherwise, everybody is, every country is infected. In just 62 days, it's now killing, you know, you have more than a 1 lakh uh, people and this is from the April 21 data. Will it end? Definitely, everyone has to cooperate. People simply don't follow basic norms. I don't know. That's the reason why the pandemic is expanding exponentially. People want everything. They don't want to work or follow basic rules. I don't know. The human nature is changing. There is a lot of loss of patience, I should say. People are not patient anymore. Please learn to be patient. That's one of the critical. I have realized over time is one of the critical uh, determinants of success. Will it continue until we have a good drug? Now we have formed a team uh, with the Mysore University, JSS. We are working on a COVID drug. We have reached to the level of animal studies. Hopefully, uh, which we will maybe the next year we'll try to come out with the drug. Now, nobody worries about swine flu. 2011, when swine flu was there, in the first year, it killed more people than the COVID-19. Now, nobody is talking about swine flu. We have good medicines. 
they get admitted with swine flu pneumonia we treat them they get cured nobody is worried about swine flu anymore the vaccines are tough situation everybody should get vaccinated the virus is mutating very fast and it's uh, difficult for the vaccine to keep up with the different mutants how does one get human to human transmission 6 feet or 2 meters so when they say social distancing that's the distance we are talking about gets a little bit worrisome it spreads through droplets when we talk cough sing or sneeze or even breathe heavily it can spread they enter not only the nose but also the eyes it can be in contact with the skin and you touch your skin and then touch the face it can spread when the ventilation is poor and people are close then there is a problem touching contaminated objects you are in a public transport you are touching the bus handle door there is a problem and then you touch the face without hand sanitation there is a risk the problem with covid-19 was a lot of asymptomatic people who had no symptoms were also so called super spreaders they spread to hundreds of people but they never had any symptoms themselves that's what's a tough situation how do we prevent the most important what we used was wearing a mask a mask has to be an adequate mask i have tried different masks i'm not sure whether you can see me but if you can see me this is how you should wear a mask the mask has to be very clear use both of your fingers to don't pinch it you will get gaps and then just see that you, you should have a metal clip here otherwise it won't fit in tightly a mask without a metal clip on the top is not useful you see now there is no space and then even in the bottom you should have a very close contact and no space everywhere top sides bottom you don't find any problem so that's wearing a mask and then don't start putting your finger in if you want to scratch you may sweat more So that's the problem. If you don't have to wash your hands and then start putting your finger, just because it's itching, then there is a problem. That's how people wearing a mask get cold. There is no close contact, and don't put your finger in without cleaning your hands first. That's critical. Again, people get infected. They go home. It's been two hours, three hours outside. Wearing a mask is very uncomfortable, and they don't know how to remove the mask. It's very very important. Only touch the sides. Don't touch the surface. Touch the sides. Remove it. Keep it away. Either you can use a UV sterilization, or don't just keep it with your regular things that you come in contact with. You can use one mask. In the clinic, we ask our people to use one mask every uh, one one day for a week. They are wearing mask from morning to night. None of them got infected. And you just use one mask a week and just keep it there. the covid virus will not survive for a week on the mask but if you touch the surface then you have a problem that's what you should not do so choose a mask that has two or more la- uh, layers washable breathable fabric can be used it should cover completely fit snugly that's the key no wire or a metal clip is very very important don't use a mask with an exhalation valve everything is going out which means you are spreading the virus n95 is generally for healthcare workers we are in very close contact even you know 2 feet away from the from the patient uh, may not be needed for uh, non healthcare workers so some people have a very very uh, you know it's made of fabric that's very difficult to breathe like vinyl don't wear such masks <coughs> i have already told you what you should do how to wear and take off your mask and as soon as you remove your mask you must wash your hands you remove the mask wash your hands before you do anything else very very critical and of course maintain social distance washing is critical what should we use at least 30 seconds don't just pour water use a sanitizer or soap and water at least 30 seconds is a critical 
point an alcohol based sanitizer does not cause antibiotic resistance don't use chlorhexidine based gels and all that please use only an alcohol based sanitizer that does not cause antibiotic or even antiviral resistance it's very very important they are safe for everyone to use they don't cause lot of skin issues dryness not much very very rarely it may cause some dry skin that's all so always use an alcohol based and don't wear a glove it's very difficult to clean and uh, it's better to use simply your hands and then clean it efficiently now what happens when people are exposed there is something called as an incubation period they are exposed no symptoms and now they usually day 5 to 6 are when the first symptoms develops and uh, the person before they develop symptoms may be contagious that's the most important point and that's the reason that this pandemic has been difficult to control now day 5 to 14 they are likely to test positive on the testing we do the polymerase chain reaction that detects the viral genetic material and is confirmatory when it is positive and the symptoms are like any other illness you have fever you have cough you have sore throat you have fatigue you have shortness of breath uh, you have body aches and headaches and symptoms may start off about one day of exposure in some people but in some people it may take 14 days for the first symptoms to come and many other symptoms also can be there including we have found blue stools vomiting uh, feeling like uh, vomiting called as nausea skin rash cold most people recover in about 2 weeks these are the more serious symptoms shortness of breath reduced oxygen in the blood uh, they cannot walk or even talk chest pain they can become confused so these are some of the more serious side effects how do we diagnose mainstay is detect the viral genetic material from a nasal or a throat swab usually both is taken and we don't have very good treatment at present we have some treatment that have some action we try to choose uh, the best possible treatment for a given patient depending upon whether we are dealing with the mild disease or moderate or severe disease so how to protect yourself always when you go out please wear a face mask stay at least 6 feet wash hands frequently that is how after seeing every patient we used to wash our hands very very critical and that prevents infection alcohol based hand sanitizer is good cover your face don't use tissue cover your hands and wash it that may be better avoid touching shared objects be very very careful if you touch anything wash your hands immediately clean and disinfect frequently touch surfaces each day do not travel if you are sick do not share food including mobile phones people use just share mobile phones it can if there is an asymptomatic carrier it can cause the disease wear a mask when you are in contact with others when you cannot achieve social distancing it's very very important you are among high risk groups you are visiting somebody you are going for a function very very important you are visiting a healthcare facility and wear a medical mask if you are sick even if the symptoms are mild or covid positive but you don't have much symptoms you are caring for a sick person wear a medical mask if you are at higher risk for severe covid 19 that's what you have to do thank you very much Uh, thank you sir yeah sure sure uh, thank you very much uh, there are certain shocking things for me personally during this presentation of yours one i thank you for using a very simple language so that we could understand most of the things and uh, second i never knew that incense sticks and uh, dhoop etc also can be a cause for cancer we thought it is 
uh, really good for health. Uh, I think now, sir, shall we move on to the question answer session? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, children, those who have anything to ask, any questions, please raise your hand as I call your names. You can ask your question. You can unmute. Yes, Grita. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, I have two questions. Good morning, sir. Yeah, yeah, good morning. Yes, sir. First, yesterday I just read an article about uh, lungs and pulmonology, and I got to know that the muscles present in the ribs also plays a very important role in inhalation and exhalation. And uh, it was very difficult, and it was under an article known as How Do Lungs Volume Changes? There were very difficult words like sterum, intercostal muscles, and different terms. So, if you could explain a bit about it, and it would be very much in, uh, informative. And uh, is there any disease which would uh, affect the intercostal muscles present in the ribs? Generally, as I told you, the main muscle for breathing is the diaphragm. If you look at the size of the diaphragm, it's one big solid muscle that separates your chest cavity from the abdominal cavity. It's one big solid muscle. That's your main muscle of breathing. There is no fatigue for a diaphragm. It, you, it works from morning till night, every day of your life. It does not get fatigue. That's, that's the primary breathing muscle. Now, there are other muscles, including the neck muscles and the muscles that are in between the ribs. You have the external intercostals and then you have the internal intercostal. These are the two intercostal muscles that are between the ribs. They are very small muscles. They get fatigue. They are not the major muscles of breathing. That's why I didn't spend time on them. And they help in moving the rib. The rib will move. You know, like uh, I'm sure you have seen the bucket handle. You know how the bucket handle moves? So that's how they move the rib. And this helps to expand the rib cage. So this is called as the bucket handle movement. So that's how the intercostal muscles work. Now, coming to the diseases affecting the intercostal muscles. Generally, you don't have any specific disease for that. But when there is a neurological disease, the nerves don't function well. That can affect the all the respiratory muscles. Now, if you, you can suddenly lift some heavy object and strain some intercostal muscles, it's localized. It's not a general disease of the intercostal muscle system. But you have generalized uh, systemic diseases, which will involve all muscles, all skeletal muscles, or the nerves that will supply the skeletal muscles, or the spinal cord, or the brain, that can affect the breathing. I hope that has answered your question. Yes, sir. Sir, another question I had, uh, due to, uh, listening to your explanation. So when the intercostal muscles contract, will the chest cavity increases? Exactly. You see so, the uh, rib. So normally rib is like this. You can imagine the bucket and the bucket handle. It is touching the bucket, right? There is hardly any space. So the ribs are all like this first. And when the intercostal muscle contract, you remove the bucket handle to 90 degrees. Now you have more space, is it not? Yes, sir. So you have the bucket handle. In this position, the handle is touching the bucket. There is no space between the bucket and the handle, right? But you move it to 90 degrees, and then what happens? Now you have space. That's how the chest cavity expands. This is called as the bucket handle moment. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Grita. Arush, can you please ask your question? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, sir, for your presentation. It was really enlightening, and I learned a lot about lungs. So uh, one doubt I had was, you said that duple tension sticks can also cause cancer. Like, what material in them or like, how does that actually work? I, I didn't quite understand that. Why, like? Most uh, noxious part of it, the, the cigarette smoke has about 3,600 different chemicals out of which a large portion of them are harmful. There is a gaseous part, there is a particulate matter. So when you want to assess the toxicity of some of these things that we have been using, they compare it to a cigarette smoke, which is 
because we don't have a lot of animal studies and data on these because they are not used in the western world right but tobacco smoke is there in the western world and they have done for decades they have done huge number of studies now they have found out that if you burn for example a dhoop stick the amount of particulate matter released is equal to burning 1000 cigarettes if you burn a uh, incense stick depending on the size and thickness it is equivalent to burning at least 5 if it is longer and thicker then maybe 15 cigarettes so that is how they have used monitoring devices how much of particulate matter is released particulate matter size 10 microns 2.5 microns 1 micron sub micronic particulate matter so called in the nanometer level so this is how they assess the toxicity of these pollutants then there is formaldehyde again it can be measured easily then there is this volatile organic compounds all related to this heterocyclic compounds like benzene and so many of these volatile organic compounds now that they compare it to the cigarette smoke and the gaseous particle uh the gaseous as well as the particulate matter is equal to if you burn one stick equal to 1000 cigarettes and 5 to 15 cigarettes so they are actually using instruments to measure when this is burning in the height where a person is breathing right so that's where people are normally breathing instead of humans they put the machine and then they measure how much it is released that's how it's tested Okay. Quite, quite shocking, as you said, sir. Because most of us, I don't think that we never thought, or we ever thought that no. incense sticks can be so no. harmful. If you go to uh, the old temples, you will only find Lakshadweep Alankara. You don't find lot yes. of them there. Yes, only yes. Only recent fancy, the smell and the jasmine and sandalwood and all those things. Yeah. All all flavors available in the incense sticks also. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Arush Reyes. Can you please ask your question? Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Uh, your session was really informative, sir. In the starting, uh, you had you had mentioned that dogs and all have uh, monopodial uh, bronchi branching, yes. and humans have uh, bipodial and tripodial uh, uh, bronchi branching. So, sir, does it affect the rate of breathing? See, we breathe at whatever rate we need to oxygenate our. Uh, uh, our you know red blood cells so if you are exercising your rate of breath is going to increase so similarly the animals that may not have the surface area of the lung that we do we have a surface area that covers the tennis court how do we do that by this change in the branching nature that leads to access to more alveoli more branch and more alveoli if a tree you you can imagine the lung is like a tree you have more branches you have more leaves is it not so it works in the same mechanism and the requirement of course of oxygen from a small animal to a large animal like a human is entirely different so you may find that the respiratory rate also may be different it's also different on the metabolism right so the dog has a much smaller surface area as compared to primates who have a different set of branches and why did this evolve we can have a larger surface area and higher efficiency of breathing which means you can breathe lesser number of times i hope that is answered your question yes sir thank you sir thank you shreyas ishanya sir hope you don't mind no sir another few questions no no i am okay okay thank you ishanya Hi. A good morning, sir. Thank you so much for taking this question uh, session. So, my question is: uh, What are the chances for a person getting uh, reinfected with COVID-19? Depends on the variants. We have had only just one or two cases who have been infected last year coming back again uh, with COVID positive. Just one or two, but I'm sure the number will change maybe next year or the day after when the virus keep on mutating itself. but it also means that you should be ever careful until we have a good drug 
that really counts. These people have gone through COVID and they don't want to get COVID again. They are far more careful this time. Maybe that's the reason uh, we are seeing less number. Also, the virus has not mutated to that extent. And even when they get infected, they may get mild disease and not visit the hospital. But there's every chance because uh, people will get influenza. Influenza also keeps on mutating. You have a vaccine, every year you have to come up with a new vaccine. And people can get infected three to four times per year with the same influenza virus because it keeps on changing. Uh, the immune system cannot differentiate. The same thing, the blue shirt is different Blue shirt with stripes is different. Red shirt is entirely different. So the immune system is like a lock and key, and it cannot, you know, uh, cannot differentiate if the mutation changes the virus to beyond a certain degree. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Any others have any questions, Lakshmi, ma'am? Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, I have a question. Uh, will there be any chances of um, the seriousness or the fatality of the COVID-19 be decreased? Just like influenza is very common. Uh, is there any chance? See the COVID year on year. In the first year, the COVID did not destroy the lungs like it did in the second year. Second year, we're just finding holes in the lungs. Completely lung is destroyed. Smoking would do that, but it will take 20 years to do that. We are seeing COVID do it in one month. Two months. So second year is being far more worse than first year. I am afraid what the third year will, will give us. And the virus, it spreads from person to person. Generally, it becomes stronger. Maybe until a certain point when everybody is infected, it cannot mutate to become a completely new virus. Maybe then it may die down. But the natural die down will take a long time. We are hoping to get a drug. Because as I said, the vaccine, what we are using now is what was prepared last year. It is not for the current virus. So even they say after the vaccine, please follow the same mask and social distancing and everything else. Because they are not confident that the vaccination will prevent the COVID infections. Maybe the severity may be less. So we have to follow the same basic norms that we did in the first year in the pre-vaccination era. The virus every 10 days it is mutating every 10 days smitten do nothing i spoke with ma'am changing, changing changing like it's like that yeah that is the problem thank you sir uh, yeah sorry for that uh thank you lakshmi and uh, sir i had a question personally uh when the covid started we were panicked naturally because number of deaths were more and newspaper reports actually spoiled our confidence in life only uh, and then uh, we had a rush of buying oximeters at home uh, and then uh, you know uh, zinc tablets were suggested prescriptions were pa passed from person to person vitamin c tablets i think most of our children also agree with this that we have a collection of these things now how how much it is correct to follow such things when it starts in a group you know prescriptions to follow and you know do we need to be so careful and so alarmed that we keep things ready with everything at home actually actually none of these things help the main thing i would advise like i said we have been taking care of covid patients we have not been infected wear a mask and we we can't maintain social distancing when you're handling patients we have those in contact with the proved covid 19 patients but we did not get infected because we've been very careful with hand washing and wearing the mask those are two critical things. Now, your vitamin C, I would prefer you get it from your lemon juice or your lemon peel pickle rather than the vitamin C per se. There are tens of thousands of nutrients in the natural food. You don't even have the technology to assess what these are. So, we moved into a more healthier diet. And when we didn't even know, knew what worked, we had to take care of patients in March when we had no idea what treatment worked. A lot of doctors were also dying. The only thing I have seen that improves the person's natural antiviral immunity is exercise. I started walking 20 kilometers a day. I still maintain more than 10, but those days I walked 20 kilometers a day. I stopped all junk food. 
and mask and hand washing. This is the four things. The natural immunity that empowers a person's natural killer cell is exercised beyond a certain threshold. Simple walking, slow walking is not going to help. It has to be at a certain intensity. It has to cross a certain threshold. This will improve the natural killer cells. They are the main killer cells that kill the virus and, and the T lymphocyte. So the immunity to be improved with the exercise, good diet, like I said, you eat fiber. The bacteria, 90% of the cells in the human body are bacterial cells, not human cells. They give good fiber, give good fermented food. The, the curd, which is uh, fermented by the bacteria, the idli and the dosas that you have, use fermented batter. The bacteria now is far different than the bacteria 20 years ago in the homes. People use a lot of, lot of disinfectants to kill all the good bacteria. Unfortunately, that reduces the quality of the idli and dosa that we eat today. But in homes where there are, they are less used, the fermented bacteria makes a big difference. And I am now an advisor to uh, 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 the scientist group from Israel who have developed uh, an immunomodulator that helps fight COVID. It is made from curds, from cow's milk. Unfortunately, the milk that we get today, that the dairy, is very, very poor quality. The best milk is when the cow eats fresh grass. The cow eats fresh grass. There is a chemical called Arabino Zyla, beautiful immunomodulator. And that is present when a you, you drink milk or curds from the cow that eats fresh grass. See, these are the, if you remember your grandmother's lifestyle, they had far fewer diseases, right? Far fewer cancers, far fewer asthma, very, very less disease. And you look at what they ate and what we are eating today. So diet makes a big difference. Physical activity makes a big difference. These are the two things that you can change today to a better health. So instead of eating and zinc, I would prefer you eat your lemon uh, peel, pickle or lemon juice. Lemon peel has 10 times more vitamin C than lemon juice. Oh. Nice. That's right, sir. Thank you. That's what, uh, as you said, food and exercise are the two mantras to keep ourselves healthy and uh, food is the best medicine uh, rather than taking any other medicines. I think Karan K. Raj has a question. Karan, can you quickly ask your question? Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, thank you for your session. It was really very informative. So, so you said that exercise is very important uh, and helps uh, uh, um, helps uh, for I mean um, helps us uh, in uh, personal health development. So, do you think timing uh, really matters when it comes to exercise? And, and if yes, then which is the best time to exercise, morning or in the evening? You can do it any time you want. Preferably, we say. Uh, no, of course, after eating, you should not do it for another two hours. But beyond that, uh, you can do it any time you want. Empty stomach is ideal time. Morning or evening doesn't matter. In fact, uh, we exercised throughout the day. We Before we went to the hospital, and saw patients, we exercised. We came back from the hospital, we exercised. Before we slept, also we exercised. So it doesn't matter. But the intensity matters. You yes, sir, can't food in the night and go on to do heavy intensity exercise, then the intensity should be lower. Yes. Thank you, Karan. Any others? Any questions? Ma'am, can you speak a few words? Ma'am, you are on mute, ma'am. Thank you so much, sir. I think he... Uh, put the things in a very simple manner, but I, I know it is so hard. As a school, we have been trying uh, our level best to give this uh, PT exercise and even the teachers and the students, but it is so hard for us to exercise. Walking, any exercise uh, people just tend to ignore and neglect. I think sir session uh, today uh, help us to be focus on that particular aspect uh, and the way he put things in, across. He, he was living the life, you know, he's living that life now. So I think that's a big example. He has become a role model for us today. All other things, what he said, maybe we can find in the newspaper or journals, or if you Google, you will get it. But he being a role model out there, and he said, this is what I'm doing. 
and please do it so uh, thank you so much sir thank you so much for taking your time off from such a busy schedule and being with us i am sure at least a few of us will take it forward and be healthy and out of covid thank you so much sir thank you thank you thank you ma'am thank you ma'am now i request uh, bhavya mishra of class 10c to render the vote of thanks bhavya thank you shantula ma'am respected dr mahesh principal vice principal teachers and students it is my honor and privilege now to give a vote of thanks to all those who helped make this program happen respected dr mahesh thank you for orating such an eloquent session the way in which you explained the structure of lungs and the functioning by giving simple examples made it so easy to learn the details you explained about covid 19 will surely be helpful for us personally these points are going to be my take away with many others our principal mr matthew kg i would thank you on behalf of us all being so dedicated thinking for our welfare being transparent and always encouraging us to grow to be humble human thank you sir our beloved vice principal ms kuvain matthew thank you for all your efforts towards helping us any time and being our backbone thank you ma'am teachers a great deal of work and efforts have been made by you thank you for always working to make our journey of learning more enjoyable somebody who we need to be grateful for is our technical team in this situation you have performed a tremendous task of conducting sessions online and assisting everyone in difficulty thank you finally yet importantly my peers this wouldn't have been an event without you with great joy i thank all of my grade mates for attending this session with all their attention and patience thank you friends new beginnings like are disguised as painful endings quotes do you loud do you with this being said we have reached the closure of the session hope you all learned something new warmest thanks to everyone present thank you we would like to see you bavya no her uh, internet is slightly weak it seems oh, ma'am so she is not able to turn the camera on sorry for that uh, sorry. thank you sir once again on behalf of anyway bhavya has thanked us formally yeah this is bhavya mishra for us thank you bhavya uh, thank children you. i would uh, request all of you to start preparing a report on the session and we'll create an assignment and you have to Uh, send the report we'll share the details to ms teams and i personally also thank mr mahesh dr mahesh because we have been trying to reach him and you know thank you sir for taking the time out ms we can understand now you are literally you can we can see you uh, you know talking to people and say another 10 15 minutes you give time we can understand at this times of covid uh, how busy you are and really thank you from the bottom of our hearts from all the family members of eps uh for coming and gracing this occasion and sharing such a invaluable uh, resource with us knowledge with us certainly as i said every one of us are walking out today with one or two key points or key in learnings from this session and we will strive our best or work hard to keep ourselves healthy keep us and our family members safe from the all the respiratory disorders as well as the covid uh this year so thank you sir uh thank you ma'am for helping us uh, and guiding us to arrange this session thank you children you you have 5 minutes of break you can take 5 minutes of break and join the next classes you can start leaving now thank you all have a nice day thank you teachers thank you sir thank you bye bye thank you sir thank you teachers thank you teachers thank you teachers thank you teachers